have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn with me to Joshua. I'm going to go coatless this morning. Joshua chapter 14, we're continuing our summer series, Forgotten People of the Bible. I, I pray you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed preparing it and, and preaching it. And We've looked at several different people that I, I don't know if you've heard messages on them before. And, we looked at Onesimus from Philemon. We, we looked at Ruth. We um, looked at quite a few different um, Old Testament and New Testament passages. And um, Today we're going to be in the book of Joshua. And I believe next week we're going to uh, be back in the New Testament. Um, but we're going to continue this probably through maybe the end of July, beginning of August as the Lord leads. Um, but I want us to look at uh, a gentleman by the name of Caleb this morning. So if you found your place, say amen. amen. And I ask that you stand, if you're able, as we honor the reading of God's holy word. Beginning in Joshua chapter 14, beginning verse number 6, the Bible says, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Zephaniah, uh, of Kezanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord, my God, who pardoned me. Now then, just as the Lord had promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out into battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord had promised me. On that day. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Lord, it is indeed a joy and privilege to gather together in your house. And Lord, we just thank you for all your many blessings, and Lord, especially for the written word that we have recited from this morning. And I pray, Lord, is that as your word goes forth, that as your scriptures promise that it would not return unto you void, and that what it will call according to its purpose to fulfill what it is that you have for us through this message this morning. And so, Father, I pray that as this message goes forth, that you would open our minds and our hearts and give us the ability to understand, Lord, and retain this message. And as my prayer is each and every Sunday, that not my will, but thy will be done. If there be any within the sound of my voice who has never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, I pray that you have your will and your way throughout this message. And we'll give you the praise. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. I heard the story about an elderly couple who had just celebrated 50 years of marriage. And as they were sitting around their living room, and the, the wife was sitting on the couch, and the husband sitting in his comfortable reclining chair, she began to ponder all the things that had happened over the years, and she said, Honey, you know, things just aren't really quite the same as they used to be. And he said, Well, well, well what are you talking about, dear? And she said, Well, there used to be a time when you would sit right up close to me. And he said, Well, I, I can remedy that. And he got up as gingerly as he could, and he walked over, and he sat down, and he said, Now, how's that? She said, Well, honey, there used to be a time when you would hold my hand. And as he put his hand in hers, he said, well, honey, how's that? And then she said, well, honey, there used to be a time when you would nibble on my neck and on my earlobes. And when she said that, he got up and began to leave. And she said, where are you going? He said, I'll be right back. i got to go get my teeth. <laughs> I like that story because I was thinking about O. Caleb here. Because to some of us, the Bible says he was about 85 years old. And that would seem quite old, but in biblical times, it wasn't. He gives us some attributes of some things that he could still do at 85. You know, I've met some senior adults in my last five, six, seven years, especially 
I don't know what it is in the water down here in Alabama, but I've met some 75, 80, 85 years old who can outwork some 20, 21 year olds at the drop of a hat. Should they be doing it? Probably not, but they could. And Caleb seemed to be that type of person who could still function at 85 years old just as he could when he was 21. Caleb went through a lot in his life. He was part of the Israelites who um, were in bondage and slavery. He, he, he was part of the group that um, had, had left the uh, uh, Egyptian um, land in, in order to fulfill God's promise that he had promised to Moses. He was one of the ones that was tasked to go into the promised land to do a recon, sort of, to spy it out, to, to, to see everything that God had declared over them come to pass. And if you remember, when he went back with Joshua and those ten other spies, it was him and Joshua alone who said, yes, we can take this land. Yes, this is what God had promised. Yes, this is not too big for God. Yet, the other ten, they grumbled. They complained. They, they, they said that the land wasn't right. They, they, they said that the, the, the land was too big. They, they said the people were too big and they couldn't do it. But I like what Caleb says. In Numbers chapter 13, he silenced the people and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we could certainly do it. Not, not maybe we should go up or perhaps we should do this. He said we should go and take possession. I like he silenced those. He silenced those other ten who, who was trying to keep Moses' ear and, and, and to prevent him from doing what God had promised. He, he was trying to silence the other ten who, who were trying to plead their case a little bit better than Joshua and Caleb. He, he, he silenced the ten that were trying to convince the others that the task at hand was impossible yet even for God. And that's sad. I love the book of Exodus and, and Joshua, and I love the, 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 the Easter story, the Passover. and Because uh, think about all the things they had just went through. Uh, through the plagues, the, the, the Lord had turned the river Nile into blood. Then, then they sent the frogs. Then they sent uh, the locusts. Right? Then there was famine. And then there was death. There, there was the, the, the plague of the firstborn. Then the miraculous reversal of Pharaoh to change his mind and let the people go. Then what happened? They, they get to the Red Sea. And listen, they're not just remembering all this. They, they experience. They get to the Red Sea. The Bible says the, speed, the, the, the sea was open. They walked through on dry land. Dry land. Not muddy land. Not, not uh, ankle deep. They, they walked through on dry land. And then when they got through, they turned around and watched the walls of the water collapse. And the Egyptian soldiers be killed. They had went through all that. They had seen all that. They had experienced all that. Yet now, after they go through the promised land, they didn't think that they could take possession of that which was promised to them. Somehow God was not going to accomplish victory through them. Well, Caleb knew different. Caleb knew that God could do all that he said he would do. Caleb knew that with God all things were possible. Caleb knew that with God that this was a minor task and that they would have victory. But because of the tents grumbling, because of Moses listening to them, because of the nation of Israel as a whole, the Bible says that they were sent out for their disobedience and they had to wander in the desert for 40 plus years. Imagine that being on the cusp of that which was promised to you. You could see it. You could feel it. You could touch it. You could taste it. And then God saying no. It wasn't Caleb's fault. It wasn't Joshua's fault. They spent 40 years in the desert until all the Israelites who had been there up until that time were gone. Except for two. Numbers also tells us that of the men who went to explore, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that survived. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Because now we, we, we let's, let's fast forward past Jericho. Let's pa fast forward past wall, marching around the wall seven times. Let's pa fast forward the, the, the victory they had. 
Let's fast forward to them now being in the promised land. And Caleb says, Moses, or says, Joshua, remember what Moses and the Lord said about me? Remember what he said about you? Remember what he promised us? He's like, I want what's mine. He, he, he wanted what was in the promised land. He wanted his inheritance. He wanted that, he wanted that victory. What was that saying? The, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat? He had felt the agony of defeat far too long. He wanted that thrill of victory. You can't blame him. You can't blame him one bit. He had to wait. Look, I don't know if Caleb sat next to his wife. I don't know if he held her hand. I don't know if he nibbled on her neck and earlobe. But you know what I do know? That the Bible says that Caleb at 85 was as strong as he was then than he was 25, 45 years ago. And he was still able to accomplish any task that God had put before him. He still had life. He still wanted to serve. At 85. You know, I've seen Christians at 35, 45, 50 who think they can't be used. Folks, you can't let barriers stop you from being used for the glory of God. You, you, don't, don't think that you're too young. Don't think that you're too old. Don't think that you're too weak. Don't think that you're too strong. Don't think that you're unskilled. Don't think that you're uneducated. Don't think that you're useless. You're not useless. You can be used. Matter of fact, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those He calls. And we need to be willing and able, at no matter what age, to stand up and be ready when the Lord calls. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. Three aspects of Caleb's life. And I like to have my notes out because that prompts you to get your notes out. You know, I've always said, somebody told me in a seminary that uh, there's a special place in heaven for those who take notes. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I want us to look at three particular things this morning about Caleb's life and this passage in the book of Joshua uh, as we look at Caleb, the mighty man of God. And I want us to first, the first thing I want us to see is we need to have foresight. We need to have, we often work on hindsight, right? Hindsight's 2020. We know what we should have done. We know what we could have done. I, I like to always say, you need to ask, what would Jesus do? Not, what did Jesus do? Right? Because people always say, well, pastor, it's, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. That, that's not always the case when it comes to that which is spiritual. Let's look at uh, verse number six to begin here. The people of Judah approached Joshua and Caleb, and they said to him, You know what the Lord said to the man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. So they're, they're remembering what the, the vision that God had for them prior to them taking possession of the promised land. But let me pose this question to you this morning. Do you think that Caleb ever imagined that he would be spending 40 years in the desert being punished for something he didn't do? I had a, a friend of mine I was talking to yesterday, and he told me a little story. And I think, and I'm not picking on young people, I'm just telling you the story. Um, the company he works for, they, they do, and I won't give all the details, that's um, irrelevant. But the company he works for has a, a variety of group of age difference in, in their fleet of service people. And their boss had to have a meeting with them to finally say, you cannot have your personal cell phone on the job. We provide you with communication. We provide you uh, with where you need to go, what you need to do. And your personal devices are becoming a distraction. Because think about it, the boss is paying them an hourly wage. If they're taking one, two, three hours a day talking on their phone and not doing their job, they're, they're, they're stealing. They're, they're wasting money. But he, had, he didn't want to call out that one person who was the habitual offender. He, he, he called a meeting of all the team, and he chewed them all out. He gave them all um, a good talking to. But think about it. He was, in essence, a little bit punished, and he was lumped in because of one person. Caleb and Joshua were lumped in with the millions because of what they did when Joshua and Caleb were ready to take possession of of the land. He, he believed that God was going to bring them out of Egypt, and he did. Caleb believed that God was going to bring them through the Red Sea, and he did. 
Caleb believed that God was going to bring them to the promised land, and he did. But he stopped short of letting them enter. So off to the desert they went. Now imagine, and would you be mad? I don't know about you. But not only was he punished with the people, he had to spend the next 40 years with those people that he was mad at. Now think about him complaining, bickering, arguing. Man, that would get on my ever-loving nerves. You remember that song? I'm going to drop some Christmas on you. Remember that song? Um, and I don't know the whole song, but the chorus goes, And mom and dad can't wait for school to start again. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And then he said, And mom and dad can't wait for school. Yeah. Amen. I feel that. Come the end of July, when, when I've got the kids sitting around being blahs and blobs and, and, and doing nothing. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for school to start again. Uh, and, and I can imagine that Caleb couldn't wait to get out of the predicament that he was in. Think about the desert sun. You think it's hot in South Alabama. The desert can play tricks on you. But we know it didn't play tricks on Caleb. How do we know? I don't know if I have it up here. Yeah, verse 7. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses' the servant promised me everything that he promised me, and I brought him back to report according to my convictions. Listen, Caleb remembered all the way back 40 years. Remember, reminiscing on the good old days. He knew what he did was right. He, he knew what he did was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He knew then and he knew now. He knew that the promises of God were true and amen. He, he knew that God was faithful and he knew after all those years he was going to get a reward for his faithfulness. Now I know we can't see the future. I, I know we don't know what tomorrow holds, and some of us don't even want to reminisce on the past because it's not even worth remembering at all. But do you have foresight to know that God wants to do something special in your life? Do we as a body of believers have foresight to know that God wants to do something amazing through us in our church? Do we have foresight to believe that? Do, 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 do we know that God is working? Caleb knew. Caleb was patient. Caleb believed that God, uh, what he said would come to pass, would come to pass. We have to have the foresight to believe that. We, we have to have the foresight to know that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. Are you praying this morning for the salvation of someone? Are you praying this morning for maybe a breakthrough in your family? Are you praying this morning for a, a job opportunity or a financial opportunity? Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing because God will do what he says he will do. It will come to pass. We just have to believe it. That's the first thing. We need to have foresight. Next you're going to see that we need to resist fear. And I love this passage. Because in verse 8, Caleb's just laying it all out there. He's calling it like, his, like, like it is. He said, my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. It seemed that Caleb here was surrounded by people who were fearful. Let's think back for a minute. The Israelites were fearful of the Egyptians. The Israelites were fearful of of the Exodus. They didn't know what was going to happen. Many times they said, oh, let's go back. Let's find somebody to take us back. Hey, we're better off in Egypt. The Israelites were fearful of their enemies. The Israelites were fearful of everything. Everything. But that's how some Christians are. Some Christians fear change. Some Christians fear confrontation. Some Christians fear evangelism. Some Christians fear the unknown. Some Christians fear everything. And that keeps them from stepping out of their comfort zone, stepping out of the box and accomplishing what God has a purpose for their life on because they fear. We're not called to live in fear. 2 Timothy tells us, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you're a born-again believer, there is nothing in this life you should fear. The Israelites, though, they, they seem to be afraid of their own shadow. <laughs> and unfortunately, Caleb and Joshua suffered for a season 
because of it. But I like what Joshua or Caleb says. He says, though the hearts of my brother melt with fear, I follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Listen, no matter what others are doing around you, no, no matter what others may say is right, no matter what sin others may say is acceptable, if it's an abomination to, to you, if it's a sin to God, then it should be a sin to you. Matter of fact, I believe it's been said like this. Wrong is wrong even when everyone is doing it, and right is right even when no one is doing it. We need not fear as born-again believers. We need to stand on the biblical foundation and principles that have been set before us in order for us to have the courage and the boldness to, to tell someone when they're wrong. Wrong is wrong, period. We're not talking about um, subjective truth. We're, we're talking about an absolute truth. And God's word is absolute truth. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It does not change. This world might change, but God's word does not change. I saw a quote just the other day, I believe, about Charles Spurgeon. It says, uh, tell me what the church or what the people in the world is saying today, and I'll tell you what the church will be saying in seven years. That's sad to think that the winds of cultural norms blow so much that it begins to affect the church. And instead of the church conforming people to God, the world is conforming the church to its ways. We've got to stand up for biblical truth and have no fear. And finally this morning, not only foresight, not only, uh, not only forget about fear, how about we exercise fortitude? I believe Caleb had a lot of fortitude. We're going to finish up. He said, now just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out and battle now as I was then. I pray that I can have uh, even a tenth of that type of passion that Caleb has when I'm 85 years old. I know my back might give me trouble at 47, 45. When I was 35, it was giving me trouble. But I know that one day that God's going to take all that back pain away from me and I'm not going to have to worry about it. But until then, I want to be able to endure like Caleb before I get to the other side. I believe Caleb understood the principle of living a life that was pleasing to God. Listen to me now. Living a life that was pleasing to God. He wasn't affected by outside distractions. He wasn't affected by outside disruptions. He wasn't affected by outside influence. He was focusing on doing the work of the Lord. He was focused on doing the will of God. I saw a uh, LifeWay study recently that talked about some of the different topics that churches were talking about and studying um, over these past five years. And they said that the number one topic when a congregation was asked what would they like to study, the number one topic, 75 to 80 percent of the people said they wanted to study the book of Revelation. But more specifically, they wanted to study end times. It's called the doctrine of eschatology. And I, and I get that a lot as a pastor. And I'm going to give you an answer, man, but I'm going to tell you a quick story because I ran across this quote that I thought was really relevant to what we're preaching this morning. George Whitfield, who was a great evangelist, was struggling and having some difficulties with the ministry that was set before him. And so he was sharing his life with some friends, and he was telling them about the burdens. He said he was glad for the work that he had, but he prayed that it would soon be over uh, and that he would depart this earthly scene for Christ. And there was an older gentleman there, and, and uh, Brother Whitfield tapped him on the shoulder and said, Brother, you're the oldest among us. Do you not rejoice to think that your time is so near at hand and you'll be called home? And listen to what his older friend, the counsel that he gave him. He said, I have nothing to do with death. My business is to live as long as I can, as well as I can, and serve my Savior as faithfully as I can until he thinks it's time to call me home. Do I believe in studying from A to Z, from Genesis to the book of Revelation? Amen. Do I believe that 
that God's word is true. Amen. Alpha and the Omega. Beginning and the end. From the first to the last. However, there is so much more to the Christian life than just studying the end times. We need, as born-again believers, uh, if we want to live out our faith and, and concentrate on living a Christian life, we need to, we need to strive to see souls saved. Well, we need to strive to see people baptized. We need to strive to see believers discipled. And we need to uh, strive to see those believers discipling others. That's what we're called to do. Yes, I believe in the whole countenance of Scripture. I believe we need to study it. But sometimes we can't just sit around and study it. We've got to live it. It's got, we've got to put action to God's Word. We've got to be on the front line. I heard somebody this week say, we're in a war, a spiritual war, and we are soldiers in that war. I remember when I was in the military, only on a couple of occasions, I had to dig a foxhole. Dig a foxhole? Man, it ain't fun. If I remember correctly, the, the depth of the foxhole had to be... I can't remember if it was the tallest person, the, the uh, underarms of the tallest person, the shortest person. Um, but it had to be deep. And it couldn't just be haphazard because you're preparing to fight for war. What are we doing to prepare to fight in our war? Are we spiritually digging into God's Word? Or are, are we studying on our own times more than just on Sunday and just on Wednesday? Or are, are we doing what God has called us to do? That's why I love Caleb. He was ready, willing, and able, no matter what, to live his life for God. In church, we need to concentrate on living this Christian life before this life passes us by. You know, I preached not long ago about having no regrets. None. You don't want to get to the, towards the end of your life and just start regretting about the things you didn't do. Well, I wish I had been more influential in my faith. I wish I would have um, you know, talked to, to more people about Christ. I, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. Instead of wishing, why don't you do it? Now's the time. Caleb was a man of action. He was a mighty man of God. And he was willing to do whatever it took to accomplish God's task. He lived in a different time. He, he wasn't there to share the gospel. He wasn't there to evangelize. He was there to be part of God's remnant, to be part of God's people. And they had a task set before him because God was still developing them as a nation. He was still over them. Moses was their prophet. You remember, when, once they get past Moses, what they say? Oh God, give us a king like all the other nations had. You know what's sad about that? They had God himself as their leader. And they didn't want to bother. They wanted a man. Now we have a man as our leader when we wish we had a man who would follow after God's own heart. Can't have it both ways. So this morning, if you're here and you say, well, I get it, Pastor. I know, you know, there's so much we could be doing or so much. Look, we, we can make excuses all the day, all the live long day. But the fact of the matter is, we've got to start living out our life in a way that pleases God. And I, look, I'm not saying you're not doing that. But I'm just saying there's always room for improvement. And if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, please don't leave here without knowing. I shared with uh, our prayer group meeting this morning. And I'm, I'm sure Brother Don shared with you the Fletcher family in Pine Hill. I'm still getting information. Did anybody, anybody know? Before, did he pass? Okay. Um. About 20, 21 years old. I, I knew the, the mom and dad and the sister. I didn't know Tim. But please pray for that family. Freak, it was a freak accident. Yeah, so please pray for that family. We, we don't know. 21 years old. We don't know what tomorrow is. And I'm so thankful we know the one that holds tomorrow. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, don't leave here. The altar will be open. You can come. I'll pray with you. You can pray on your own. But make sure that you know Jesus as your Savior before He does call you from this earth. Would you pray with me?